us to do that. Okay, let's move on to our final item, uh, discussion on uh, the police department staffing plan. Chief Manley, why don't you uh, start us off and then we can have some conversation. Certainly, and I'm mindful of the time, so I'll uh, I'll, I'll kind of hit the high points here so that there's time for questions uh, and, and I don't eat it all up. So uh, just as, as a way of, of, of where we're at right now, um, the authorized strength of the Austin Police Department pre-budget was 1959 and now we're at 1809. So the authorized strength right now is 1,809 positions and we have roughly 45 vacancies in the department right now. Um, based on these uh, increasing numbers of retirements and resignations that we have uh, been seeing. Uh, to give you a sense of what that looks like, on average, our attrition rate at the police department was hovering around seven, seven and a half due to retirements, resignations, or terminations. Uh, the past couple months, we've seen that uh, spike to 15, and our average year to date is 13. So this isn't just a recent past couple of month issue. We're seeing a much higher attrition rate. And um, obviously, that challenges us as we move forward into next year, as you and I talked about last week, that if that attrition weight were to continue, and if we were able to get this March cadet class underway, as everyone's working so hard towards, we would still have another eight months without having any new additions to the department. So during that roughly 12-month period, we could see anywhere from 100 and 150 to 180 additional vacancies if we don't see that uh, rate taper off. So that's something that we're very uh, conscious of right now. Um, our, our, I guess we, when it comes to um, the staffing level, I know we talked about how do you know what is the right number of officers to have on a patrol, uh, out on patrol? How does a community make that decision? Um, without spending the, the entire presentation on histrionics, we all know we used to have a, a method by which we just did two officers per thousand, but for many reasons, we got away from that. We went to the community engagement time, and, and back in 2016, we received a report from the Matrix uh, Corporation on staffing. And I think that that's important because um, they, they are the ones that have probably done the most recent deep dive into the data to look at staffing. They actually pull all of our CAD data for every call from service from March 1st, 2015 through February 29th, 2016. They pulled a year's worth of data, all the calls, and they mapped it out as far as how much time officers were spending on calls, therefore how much downtime did they have, how much time did they have to conduct community policing. And with that minimum threshold that they said should be at 35%, that became our benchmark. So that was the methodology they used is by analyzing a year's worth of data to see where are we spending our time and where might we have extra time and where might we have time that uh, unfortunately calls are exceeding the, uh, the demand. They did do a staffing study in theirs and what they had down was the, um, the staffing recommendation they had for 2016, the year they were hired, was that we should have 797 positions on patrol based on their analysis of call load. And then they did forward projections through the year 2020. And without wasting time year by year, when you get to 2020, their estimate based on the growth of the city and the estimated growth in calls was that we should have 863 positions on frontline patrol. And we currently have 773 positions assigned to patrol. So we're doing what we can with what we have. We're 90 short of what they think we should have on patrol, but that emphasizes the need for us to do what we put in place a few months ago, and that is rotating officers back to patrol so that we can maintain at least the staffing level of 773 to keep up with call load, call response times. Um, as we move forward with the reimagination process, if we do see some of the work that we do now moved elsewhere to somebody else's area of responsibility, then we might see that need for officers in one way or another decrease, but none, that has not yet happened. So we're just trying to ensure that we keep enough officers on the front line. So we did eliminate 150 positions from the department from all those specialized units that I know that you all have been made aware of. And when we eliminated the 150 positions that freed up 95 officers because some of those positions were vacant, obviously. So those 95 will go back to patrol just to keep us at that level of staffing so that we can handle 
what is our primary responsibility, and that is responding to those emergency calls for service. If this attrition rate keeps at the level that it's at right now, I expect we will be transferring more officers back to patrol in those months leading up to whenever we can get another cadet class to graduate. So we're paying very close attention um, to, um, to those numbers. The methodology that we used when we decided where we were going to pull officers from, uh, the first thing that we did is we looked at those areas that were performing functions, although very important to our community, they were functions that a patrol officer could perform. We have an issue with drinking and driving and fatality crashes in our community. We've had a, a, we have a large DWI contingency here at the department, but what we did is we ended up cutting that unit in half since on-duty patrol officers can also enforce DWI laws. So using the similar methodology, we looked at the park police, although it was a very important function, every park lies within a patrol district that has a patrol officer assigned. So that officer can respond to calls in the park or as and if time allows, do proactive work in those parks. So that was the first area that we looked at really was those areas where officers were conducting work that patrol could kind of pick up the workload if they had to. We then looked at those areas that are important but that could be maybe conducted by somebody else, such as security at municipal court. Again, I know they very much wanna have Austin police officers in the courtroom and I understand that, but that is work that could be done by a private security firm or some or, or other security personnel since we so desperately need the officers on the front line. So we then went through that uh, next cut of where do we have officers doing work that someone else could be hired potentially to come in and do that work. And then it really got to, now we've just got to make the tough decisions of where else are we going to pull officers from? And the district representative unit was a very difficult one for us because in this day when we're focusing on community policing, that is one of our key areas where we're doing that. But the matrix report back in 16 had actually recommended that we do this and we didn't do it because we didn't want to. But what we're going to do is um, we actually implemented a program where although we're going to reduce the number of people in the DR unit, as we hire cadets into the department and as they're waiting for their cadet class to begin, we're going to work to offer them temporary jobs in the DR unit so that they will be exposed to the community policing side of the department, working with our community outreach groups before they ever even reach the academy. We won't be able to do that for all of them, but that's just a way we're going to try and at least make enhancements out of some of the changes that we have coming our way. So let me wrap here just real quickly because I want to make sure that I'm on target with what you want me to talk about and then leave time for questions. But we're paying very close attention to where we're headed with the vacancy rate and with the attrition rate that we're seeing right now to make sure that we are able to respond to the 911 calls for service in a manner that our community both deserves and expects. And as we work through the reimagination conversation, if workload shifts away from the police department to other either city entities or groups, then that might minimize some of the demands on us and then we would make adjustments accordingly. Thank you, Chief. I, I really appreciate you laying that out. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's often a lot of media coverage about every little decision that's being made. And um, it's reassuring to know that just because a unit was shifted to patrol, it does not mean that the name of that unit is no longer being policed. It just, it's being done through patrol resources and a different methodology. So um, specifically, you know, we were seeing reports that, oh, well, they're not gonna do DWI enforcement anymore. Well, that's not true. It just happens as part of the patrol uh, patrol work. So that's that's very reassuring to hear. Um, I'm, I'm kind of excited to hear you talk about the matrix report because, you know, I came onto the council right in 2017. It was almost right after that report came out. And, and I spent some time reading through it. I'm rereading it now to make sure I haven't forgotten it a couple of years later. Uh, and the, the community policing target at 35%, as you said, is identified in the matrix report. In the, the, the dashboards that uh, staff, the SD23 dashboards that they gave us, it shows that the 2019 rate was 28%. So it's less than 35%. But it's not zero. Like, it, it, like we're not doing that bad when it comes to that kind of uh, uh, community engagement. If 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 that's the question, I think there's going to be some ongoing work I want us to do, and and we'll probably do some of it. Kind of you and I one on one, and and other council members one on one. But getting a better understanding of what officers 
what, what it is that they do during that 35% of time or the 28% of time, according to the 2019 SD23, so that it's clearer to me that that uncommitted time, is that supposed, is that better done during the day because more people are around and there's more community to engage with? Is that better done overnight because it's more of a patrol function and you're just kind of like eyes on the street? I think I'm, there's an information gap for me about what the actual work looks like during that time. And then the other piece that was in the matrix report that you and I talked about, I remember, I don't know if you remember, we had this conversation right back in 2017. I, I re it's one of the, the times I can remember having a meeting in my office. It seems like a million years ago, but um, there's a, a, a new classification of responder called a community service officer that's identified in the matrix report as a civilian. And I remember you and I talking about that and there being some, some, some kind of, work to be done around what, what those roles could be in the context of state law. And it's not quite clear if the matrix report accommodated state law in their analysis or their recommendation run those civilian positions. And even then, I think it was 12 to 15. It wasn't like a hundred civilians. Or it was anything. 12. Yes, sir. It was 12. Yeah. Um, you know, though, that's, that's the type of thing that I'm really interested in, in renewing a conversation around um, because uh, obviously that is going to be an area of recruitment that is a little different and a little more streamlined than recruiting and training and launching sworn officers. Um, that's, that's more work for us to do. But I, I, I think what I'm hearing you say is that, that there's somewhat of a guiding principle rooted in the matrix report. And that helps me kind of understand the, as, as I'm kind of doing my work and we're all doing our work and you're doing yours. And as I often have to remind the public, you know, the chief does have some independent authority in state law. And so we have to be partners in this work because it's not a typical organization where there's a boss and everybody works for the boss. That's not how government works, where you all got to work together. Um, so so that that part makes me feel better that that a lot of the officers or, or some significant areas that I think was getting a lot of immediate attention. It's not what the way it was being reported and that. You know, I'm certainly willing to to try and expedite getting cadet classes, provided we can get the training we like and the processes and all that stuff figured out. Whether or not that's in March, I think you'll find a variety of opinions about the likelihood of March. But um, that's kind of where where my head is at, and uh, I think we'll be we'll be spending a lot more time digging into call diversion as a metric in your decision making process. That way, as we're making our decisions on the budget side, we can make sure that we're um, that we're, we're as predictable as possible for each other, which I think is just a, an essential way to move forward so that we can be know as we work with staff, as we work with folks on where the money's going to come from, that we can have some level of predictability with how that's going to impact uh, the department and other departments. Anybody want to, uh, any have questions for the chief on staff and plan? Council member Kitchen. Um, uh, thank you. Um, Chief, I wanted to talk some more about the DRs um, and, and wanted to understand a little bit better your thinking about um, if, I, if I heard you right, that there was some reduction in the, in the DRs, not reduction is not the right word, but some moving out of DRs into patrol, if I understood that right. So I want to confirm that. Also, I, I want to speak to that some because uh, and get your perspective uh, from what I've seen, that the DR, DR role is a critical role with regard to community policing in the sense that the DRs are the, are the, the point of contact uh, for neighborhoods uh, about what, uh, what may be more systemic that's going on in their area. So I'm very, very concerned about um, thinking that the DR role is one that could be done by a patrol officer and that may not be what you said, because I'm, I'm not sure if that's what you said, but I, I hear what you're saying in terms of the rationale for the other um, areas in which there was um, a move of officers back into patrol. I just don't see that as the same for DRs. But, but why don't you um, to help me understand what, what, you were, what the thinking is around the DRs? Certainly. And no, we did cut the DR unit in half. These changes will reduce the number of DRs in the city in half. And it's a very difficult decision to make, but we were forced with having to make very difficult decisions because 
It's not as if we had officers performing work that was not important to our community, really anywhere in the department. And so it was looking at those areas where we had officers performing work that was not frontline responding to 911 calls for service. And once we got through those first two tiers, the first tier being work that could be done by the on-duty patrol officer, and uh, although the on-duty patrol officer will be able to do it, not having dedicated officers to do it will impact that service level, but it could still be done. And then the second level, work that could be done by others, such as municipal court uh, security, as I talked about, and some other areas, we then got to where we were having to look at areas of the department that are critical. And the district reps was one, but we actually, when you're looking at the list that we had with looking at our, our criminal interdiction units, uh, narcotics, gang officers, things like that, um, there's only so many places we can pull officers from. And with having to remove 150 positions from the department, we had to go into these units that uh, are very important to our community, but that we unfortunately had to remove positions from. So the Matrix Corporation, if you'll remember back in 2016, that was one of their recommendations was to cut our DR program in half and to hire civilians into those roles because some of the work that DRs do needs to be done by a commissioned officer, but some could be done by a civilian. Uh, we didn't want to do that in 2016 because these positions are very important to us and very important to the community. And so we didn't. And we've held on to those positions, you know, all the way through the current. But again, for the reasons I've stated, we're now in a position where we're having to to cut those in half. And, and we will do everything that we can do to continue the functions that those DRs were doing. Uh, we're going to, as I said, supplement them to the best that we can with incoming cadets so that they get the opportunity to see that service oriented um, uh, mission that we really do have before they even get into the academy. Um, but that was the reasoning behind um, pulling those officers. So let me ask some follow up questions. So how many positions out of DR? I'm not I don't have it in front of me. How many when you say cut it in half, I'm trying to remember how many positions that is. So the DR, the DR units um, are done in, their, um, in, in the regions, and they'll have eight per region, and we were reducing four per region is what we were doing. And so, so again, total, total is, that about, uh, is that about 16 people we, or so? Or we'll more have, than we should have 18 by the time we're done because of the downtown area command as well. Okay, so there's about 18 spots that uh, we're moving out of DR into patrol. Is that right? Yeah, I can, hold, I can give you the exact number just to make sure. It does, yeah, it looks like it's 18 that are getting pulled from the DR unit. Okay, so I have another question for you. So you pulled 150 because you were trying to reach the, get 95 to patrol? No, um, we, we pulled the 150 because as a result of the budget that passed in October, we had 150 positions removed from the department. So I had to remove 150 positions out of the organization. So this was not just to put officers back on patrol. Even if we weren't needing to put officers back on patrol, I would have had to eliminate 150 positions. Well, here's my question, Chief. Is so uh, my, my question is that the, the thinking about 90 needed on patrol is based on the projections that the matrix report made, if I'm understanding correctly. Is no, that it's also it's also based on what we're I, I think that there was maybe a belief by some that if a position was vacant, it wasn't needed. And although we had a large number of vacancies back when the budget passed, we were backfilling many of those positions, most of those nights with officers on overtime. And that was just to handle the call load, just to keep up with response times. And so these 95 are just to keep patrol at a level where both the community and the officers are safe while they're doing their jobs. And we are having appropriate response times and, and, um, and uh, adequate coverage. OK, so that's what I wasn't understanding and would like a little bit more about is that is that what 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 is the data that's driving the, the numbers that you that you uh, moved into patrol. Um, so it sound, at first I thought you were saying it was the matrix uh, reports uh, projections, but, but I'm hearing you now say that it has to do with uh, keeping up your, your standards on response time. Is that what it is? So the matrix report, I was uh, speaking with. Well, uh, wait a minute, Chief. My, 
Chief, I, I, me... I, mean, I think this will answer. I was speaking with the chair about the okay. matrix report as establishing the baseline for why it is we say there should be a certain number of people on patrol. Matrix actually did a very in-depth analysis of the data to show how many officers are needed out there just to handle the calls. I'm choosing the the 95 uh, as a result of there are so many vacancies on patrol that that's where we have to move the officers to. And with eliminating the 150 positions that we had to eliminate, those 95 then filled out there on patrol so that we have enough officers again to respond to the calls. I'm sorry, you're on mute. I don't want to take up any more time because I know others have questions that I may follow up afterwards. But here's my question. I, th I think that I really see the DR's role is very important in the community. And I, and I see them, uh, and, I, and I'm not quite convinced yet from, because I'm not understanding exactly which data you're tying this to in terms of the number of officers that uh, are necessary to move into patrol. So um, I'll send you a question about that and you can let me know. I mean, uh, obviously we need to keep up our standards for response time in the community that the patrol officers are responsible for. But I'm wanting to make sure that we're, we're that these decisions, particularly when you're talking about moving officers out of DR, uh, that the, that these position that the positions you're moving in are, are are necessary to meet the standard and are not just based on a projection related to population. So um, so I'll follow up with a with a question. I don't want to take up more time because I know people have other people have questions. Thank you, Councilmember Kitchen. If you look in the matrix report, you can see it's towards the end. I think it starts. I'm pulling it up right now. So it's like page 165, I think, where it talks about. Uh, dropping maybe six sworn DRs and replacing them with 12 civilians. I think that's what the matrix report talked about back in 2016. Yes, I'm, I'm, very from, I'm very familiar with the matrix report. So I appreciate that. Um, and, you know, I, you know, and it could make sense to go ahead and, and, and move in that direction, you know, with uh, some non-sworn officers. And I'm, I'm not really commenting on, on that. I just think that we, those positions need to be filled because they make a big difference uh, in neighborhoods to, to uh, and they, and we work closely with DRs on a whole range of issues, as you know, uh, in the neighborhood. So, so Chair, maybe that's another conversation that we should be having is about there's some dollars in there for some civilian positions that we need to look at. Yeah, sorry for the confusion, Council Member. I was mostly letting the public know where to go find that information in the report. Yeah, uh, that's fine. Mayor. Thank you. Mayor, go ahead. Go ahead. <clears throat> and I don't know in how much depth to, to go in here, probably not that much, but I didn't know this is the conversation uh, that we were going to be uh, uh, having today uh, with respect to the, the, the two decisions and what needed to be done. Uh, but as I read the, the work that you had done back in August when you laid this out, Chief, uh, you had talked about uh, taking uh, 150 uh, spots out of the uh, uh, units and moving them into patrol, as you just talked about here. Uh, and over over a third of those uh, at the time it was happening were were already not already not filled, uh, and so my understanding was is that that uh, while uh, a third of the unit positions weren't filled at that point anyhow, you were able to backfill into the patrol, backfill into the unit positions by using overtime or and or you were backfilling into vacancies in the patrol with the overtime that was available to you. Uh, and you were working both with the number of officers you have and as well as with the, the, the overtime uh, allotment uh, that you that you have. Uh, is that correct? Yes, Mayor, that's correct. Okay. Uh, so, so part of it is in terms of how many people you need to move and where you move them to, uh, depends to a certain degree on how much overtime you have to be able to backfill and, and, and that kind of thing. My understanding was that when you did this, uh, there were two um, uh, significant uh, pots of money that uh, the council had earmarked for overtime uh, that, that you didn't think you had access to um, or uh, was not available to you uh, or you didn't want to use. Uh, one of those, when we when we put off the uh, uh, cadet class, 
Uh, the council had discussed as we went through the budget process uh, about using some of the spots that would be filled up by not having a cadet class with officers that could be moved to patrol. Uh, and another one was uh, overtime, a uh, second source of overtime that the council had intended for you to be able to have access to uh, was uh, specific dollars that were uh, earmarked for overtime and were parked in the reimagining component of the, of the budget, the, the, the third tier. Uh, is that right? Those two pockets, you didn't think that you had access or availability to? Correct. There was, the, there was $3,174,000 in the reimagination fund that we believed was for whatever the reimagined efforts were going to be. And then there was another $2,272,000 that was the equivalent of the cadet instructor salaries with the belief that we would just move all of those cadet instructors back into patrol, given that there weren't to be any cadet classes. So those are the two um, areas you're talking about. Yes, sir. Okay. So, about, so a little over $5 million in overtime that the council had intended for you to have access to. Uh, when I went back and looked at the record uh, and, the, and the transcript in this, uh, some of that stuff was discussed explicitly. Uh, and, and the council said, hey, take these money. We're not going to have the classes. You can move some people out to patrol. Uh, and then we put into the rider, if, if that doesn't give you enough overtime to be able to function, then come back to us. Uh, so I would have anticipated and, and would hope that if that's dollars you don't think you can actually put into overtime, that that would be something you would come back to the, to the council to, to talk about. With respect to the over $3 million that was put into the reimagining fund, the reimagining fund consisted of things that, that the council uh, didn't discuss at all about uh, whether or not we actually wanted to continue them or not. We, we created a bucket of things that we said, hey, let's take a look at these things so we could decide whether or not they should be cut. Uh, and that uh, the, the language about whether or not was specifically added in the rider uh, that uh, we passed when we were doing the budget. So I think that and then, and then the question came up specifically, did you have access to that three and a half million dollars to be able to use presently, uh, to be able to use as, as you needed with respect to overtime? And at the request of uh, the council, uh, city attorney's office, uh, I engaged uh, council member Kassar in a discussion of that to make clear that that, that over $3 million was available to you. So my question is, is that in August, you gave us a staffing plan that, that had people moving out of patrol, out of units and into patrol, um, um, recognizing that some of those people moving out weren't filled even at that time. But some of the assumptions with respect to what you needed to do in part depended on how much overtime you had available. Uh, and, and once it was corrected uh, and, and reminded that the council had specifically said that over $3 million of that was available for overtime and presently available for overtime. Uh, doesn't that give you more flexibility than you thought that you had back in August um, when you were doing the staffing plan? I think the, the access to that $3,174,000 for overtime gives us some flexibility, but with the vacancy rate we have right now of roughly 45 the increased attrition rate of 13 to 15, if we didn't transfer all 95 of these officers on January 17th, I believe we'd be transferring the balance of them by March or we'd have to, we'd have to extrapolate that to look at it because we're, we're seeing such a high attrition rate that we we're, we're trying to keep up with that and, and then that those dollars are also needed for many other functions within the police department such as officers that need overtime for going to court officers that get held over on late calls and so there's a lot of other uses for those dollars so yeah. i have, so i have the work that you did in august where you laid out in pretty significant detail what it was that you needed to do based on the assumptions that we were making at the time based on what you perceived to be the uh, vacancy level per patrol shift, at which point you would then need to actually move people out of units because you didn't have the overtime to be able to backfill. What I have not seen is that same analysis that would have been done in August 
uh, if it had been pointed out to you that uh, the council specifically earmarked an additional three to five plus million dollars for you to have available for overtime. Uh, and when that information that I have pointed that out to, to, uh, to, to assistant city manager Ariano and to the manager, uh, together with some of my other colleagues on the council, because uh, if that gave additional time uh, to be able to do stuff from mid-January into mid-March or beyond, that got us into the position where the council would be doing as we set out to do that mid-year kind of reevaluation. Uh, so that could be impacted by that work that's done. There's a significant difference between a January, mid-January call date and a mid-March call date in terms of the council being able to take action as part of that review. And since in the rider, we specifically said, you know, we've, we've now given you an additional $5 million for overtime, uh, and we think that that's sufficient for you. If for whatever reason that's not sufficient, we said in the rider, please come back to the council and tell us that the overtime budget that you have is not sufficient so that the council could consider taking action. And you haven't come back to the council yet to, to, to do that. So I don't need us necessarily to work through this at this meeting that's going on right now. Uh, but I think that uh, there's a conversation to, to be had with respect to uh, the staffing plan that was introduced in August based on the faulty assumption with respect to the overtime dollars that were available correcting that with what the council actually did and allowing for the, the circuit breakers that we allowed for when we did that budget might lead us to a, to a different place. Uh, and that's a conversation that I know that I've been asking for and several of our colleagues have been asking for. Uh, and, and I guess uh, not just directed toward you, but to uh, uh, Assistant City Manager uh, uh, Ariano and to uh, the manager, um, uh, to the manager, uh, that's a conversation I think we need to have because apparently there was a, a mistaken assumption with respect to the overtime dollars that were available. Uh, and then there was also uh, fail safes or circuit breakers that we built into the system uh, should that overtime not be sufficient, none of which have been, have been exercised. So I, I just that issue now just because this conversation came up and I hadn't anticipated it was going to be coming up here. Sure. And just one response. Uh, I do believe the $3.174 million that's in the reimagination fund is accessible to us, but the $2.272 million was a removal from our budget. So those that $2,272,000 uh, $2, was a one-time removal from our budget, but the $3,174,000 is dollars that we should have available to us to use for over time, as well as all the other cost drivers that we have with late calls and um, and court costs and all of that. Right. right. And the time you were doing your budget in August, you did not think that was available. The three point one million. No, no, Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Did you have something to add? I just wanted to add that yes, in fact, uh, we've certainly heard these concerns, whether it's the DRs or any of the number of other units that the that uh, the chief has had to you know make some significant decisions around. Uh, as I'm understanding, most of these decisions or changes would be happening in January. I'm not sure that uh, the DRs are ones that are uh, currently in place. Uh, but one of the things that I know in conversations with the city manager is now that we understand. Now that that 3.2 million in the reimagining fund may be available to us, I think he's been working with the council members, with you and, and other council members, to see how best to formalize that if if needed. Uh, and then he's asked the chief to prioritize with that funding. You know, how might we mitigate some of the changes that he's had to consider? Okay, Councilmember Alter, then Councilmember Toto. Thank you. I've been uh, part of these conversations with Mayor Adler since. August, and I'm pleased to hear Chief Manley recognize that that $3 million um, was made available and was the intention through the budget process um, for overtime if what was in there was not sufficient. Um, and I believe that Mr. Ariana um, said that 
they're working on a plan. Um, I just want to make very clear that some of us have been asking for this plan and how it modifies things for, for quite some time. Um, and I would really like to know when we are going to have that plan because those extra couple of months really do make a big difference in the context of the broader policy and budget discussions that we are having. Um, and I understand that the attrition rate is higher um, than what was anticipated this back in August when we had raised this, um, that might not have played out in the same way. Um, and I just, you know, I'd like to know from Chief Manley, you know, when we would have that plan, uh, because there are also differences, um, you know, in terms of counts and, you know, I, I wasn't also aware that this was the full discussion we were having today. So I, I don't have my notes on hand for the exact numbers, but I think there, you know, there are other elements of this too. The mayor mentioned the 55 positions that were already not filled. So you're really moving, you know, 95 positions. And then there was um, out of those 95, you were already, even before we did our budget, moving 40 to 60 folks. Um, so the marginal difference is not the magnitude that um, we're being told. Um, and and that, is, that is frustrating. But I would like to know when we're going to get the plan. We built in um, those circuit breakers with respect to overtime. We also built into um, the budget, a budget rider where we would be looking at um, the cadet classes um, and moving forward as soon as the, the training was revamped. Um, and that is also something I would continue to like us to, to see moving forward if we can get those curriculums changed as needed. Uh, Councilmember Alter, to your question, um, we are prioritizing those positions that, uh, again, off frontline officers cannot uh, conduct and identified 47 of them. The cost to do those 47 full-time year round on overtime is gonna exceed $6 million. And on any given year, we're going to spend between 12 and, and 14 to 15 million in overtime. And so with the 3.2 million, I believe we had in our budget this year, plus the additional 3.1 million in the reimagination fund, we're at about say 50% uh, of what we would spend in any year on overtime, just trying to operate the department with all of the overtime drivers, whether it's late calls, court costs, backfill and the like. So we're trying to be reasonable. And I understand the concerns with moving officers and what is the possibility of not having to move them if we add some overtime dollars. But our overtime expenditure in any given year, again, is going to be that 12 to 14, 15 million dollars. And right now, uh, even using the reimagination funds, we're in the six million dollar range. So it's a large delta to have to cover. And as officers continue to leave, if that attrition rate continues, then then that's going to drive the need to potentially move more officers. So, Chief, I don't have the numbers um, in front of me from from my notes right now. Um, but I believe there are also portions of that overtime that were in that, you know, $11, $12 million overtime budget, which we started from, um, that were from things that, you know, are, are not, um, you know, that are special events and other things that are part of that budget. And so we just should be careful what we're counting. I don't have the numbers, so I don't want to get a debate over the numbers. Uh, but, I, but I think that there are pieces of this that are not fungible. I agree with that, but I don't think the numbers add up to the to the 15, 16, that's not what we saw um, last year in our budget. We looked very carefully when we were reviewing things to understand the choices that you are making um, at what the overtime levels were and where try to understand where the miscommunication had happened and narrowed it down to the fact that you had decided that you needed to um, keep those officers training people even though there were no cadets there um, as well as concerns over whether you had access to the three million. Um, and we did very carefully in the budget riders provide an opportunity for um, you to come back to council um, to talk to us about the about the overtime. Um, and there's not really a question there. I just wanted to, to clarify that. Certainly. And council member, we're keeping the, just, just for your information, we're keeping the instructors at the academy because there's so much work being done at the academy right now on reimagining training and how we're doing training. They need to be an active part of that and they need to be out there to update lesson plans, to be a part of the work of designing the academy of the future. And 
They have to be out there several months in advance of a cadet class ever beginning just to get curricula plans and things like that in place. So that's why they were left in place. Sure. And I, and I hear that and that makes sense. Um, and I think that should have been raised by you during the budget process. Councilmember Tovo and then Councilmember Kassar. Can't hear you, Kathy. Chair, I think she's indicating she's going to call in. She okay. has the phone. We still I don't, can't. I don't, yeah, I don't see a phone number calling in yet. Um, Greg, do you want to ask your question while while Kathy calls in? Sure thing. Um, well, no, I think it's a broader point, but I'm I'm happy to have it confirmed by everyone here. While this discussion is, of course, important, I think it might um, send the impression that any of these numbers or officer positions or changes have been uh, are certainly going to happen. And my understanding is that none of what we've discussed here has been approved by the city manager yet. I believe that there were uh, reports and documents that, uh, that, that you know, were being circulated and as people worked on this. But my understanding very clearly from the city manager's office is that in fact, while we're talking about all these numbers, none of this has actually been finalized or approved. Is that correct? And if I may, uh, I'd say that's correct. Again, there's this opportunity now that we bet, we understand clearly that the 3.2 million in the reimagining fund is available uh, to ask the chief to see how we might prioritize the, the changes that he might uh, be able to return back to service. And uh, Council Member Alter, to your question, we haven't really had a chance yet to determine when we might be able to meet uh, and make those decisions, but I know the, the city manager is um, trying to get that uh, done as quickly as possible so that there's certainty certainly for the council and the community and for the police department. Thank you. Um, Chair, I understand that Kathy needs to be unmuted by the um, AV people. She believes she's having trouble. Muting. If you're called in, I don't see you as an attendee as a phone. Can you unmute her from where you... She's not on the list is what I'm saying. There is no call-in person on the list. What about her video? Are you able to unmute her video? I mean, I can unmute her here. Yeah, thank Kathy. you. That, that's what I needed. For some reason, my computer is not unmuting. Thank you. Oh, okay. So Kathy, I wanted do you mind if I, Kathy, do you mind if I finish my- Oh, no, point really quick no that's fine. Up? I'll just try to keep it quiet on my end. I, I, will, I will handle the mute for you, Kathy. Don't worry about it. Thank you, Kathy. Sorry about that. Um, no, I mean, I, I think, again, for everybody watching or for press folks writing about this, right? It, it is important for us to have a discussion about what the plan might be. But I think that sometimes the way that it's been presented or debated here, it sounds like we're debating what has been decided for January. But my understanding for the manager's office is in fact, there is not a finalized plan for January or for March or what have you. And so what we're working on here is what that is discussing this in draft form, um, but not discussing anything that's been finalized uh, because nothing has been approved yet. And I think that it's helpful now that um, everybody's on the same page about, increasingly on the same page about what it is that we passed back in August. Um, uh, Assistant City Manager Ariano, I think that um, it was, you know, it's, it's in black and white and in the transcript what it is that we did. And I would want to, uh, I, I think that we, we laid out the right template there um, and do look forward to, to everyone talking about what it is that the final draft looks like, because I think everything currently remains in draft form. Thanks very much. Um, and this follows on nicely with, with what my colleague just said. I would like to suggest, Mayor, that we do have a conversation at one of our work sessions before the year concludes. I think this is this is a, a question and a conversation that many of us have been having with the manager and with the chief. And certainly it's one that our, our community has expressed a lot of interest in as well. And so I, I would like to follow up on this as a full council. Um, a couple of quick things. One is, uh, Chief, I thought I understood from our conversation with, along with the manager that the overtime part of, part of, uh, or one element in this whole um, puzzle is that the overtime budget 
typically, and I think you referenced this, the overtime budget that appears as overtime has not been sufficient for several years to really cover the full overtime costs of backfilling those positions. Am I understanding that correctly? That is correct, Council Member. Could you please um, provide us with some information about what that gap has been over, say, the last four or five years? I think that would help us understand what that number is. I think Council Member Alter asked, uh, you know, was speaking to that information as well um, about getting some more details on that, on what that gap is. Certainly. We, our financial staff can put that together. In years past, we've offset that with salary savings. And so there's always been a delta there with the reduction in the department and the salaries that were reduced as a result of that. We just, we, that delta is not going to be there, but we'll, we'll pull uh, a five-year history for you and uh, show you what our overtime expenditures have been compared to what we were budgeting. Thank you. That would be really helpful. And just to kind of get back to the idea about whether we're all on the same page. So I understood from my conversations with the manager that that he was having conversations with each of us on the dais and that there may be different impressions about whether um, whether the police department can access that $3 million and that there was a need for clarifying. So I'm not, you know, the manager's not here. I don't know, ACM Mariano, if, if you can speak to that. But to me, that too suggests that we really need to have this conversation as a full council. Um, it's not clear to me whether whether we all do have the same understanding about that three million or not. And if and if we do all have the same understanding why it is that that doesn't seem to be put in place. Again, when I asked the manager, the answer I thought I understood back was because there is not a consensus on that, um, on whether that money should be accessible to the department or not. Perhaps I'm misunderstanding that, but that was that was the um, understanding I took away from that conversation with the manager. And I think that's my last, probably for the moment, that's my last comment. But actually, well, AC Mariano, if you want to respond and then, and then I might have a follow-up. I'm going to get muted. Yes, council member. I think that is from my, my conversations as well with the city manager, that there is some uncertainty in terms of how that understanding is. Uh, and uh, in my conversations with him and your, his conversations with you, he is trying to determine how best to formalize the accessibility of uh, the $3.2 million. So I just want to really highlight that because I think one of my colleagues said a minute ago that there was, or, or and again, I may be misinterpreting what was said, but I thought I heard a colleague of mine um, suggest that there was, you know, an understanding that the department should have been able to access that all along and that that just isn't the case and i so what so what is the manager waiting for what do you need from the council in terms of a resolution to this issue you need the you need the council to discuss and deliberate and make a decision about that so i'm not aware of that level of uh, uh decision making or process based on the conversations he's certainly having individually with the council members so i'll be sure to go back uh, and formal or determine kind of how best uh, he wants to proceed on that. I know as council member Kassar has just stated in terms of the way the, the budget amendment was, was brought forward, it, it seemed to be explicit, uh, but yet again, certainly from uh, the chief's perspective early on when the, when the budget was initially passed, it didn't seem as clear uh, as we're having the conversation now. And it hasn't seemed clear in the months intervening either. I know as council member Alter, mentioned several of us have been ha you know having these conversations now in the months that have have happened since that it sounds like most of us probably have been having these conversations with with um city management and with our police chief in the in the months since we've learned about the draft patrolling plan changes to patrol in the draft plan so it, it seems to me really imperative that we get to a resolution of this issue pretty quickly and and if the manager is waiting on a response and a decision or a deliberation from council, then I would really suggest we schedule that right away so that the chief knows whether that's that 3.2 million or not. In the work session, uh, I know that in the conversations that I had, and obviously none of us can talk to the uh, majority of the council given the open meetings record. Uh, I know that uh, Councilmember Alter, Councilmember Kassar, uh, reading it the same way that, that I did and that the intent during the time of the budget as requested by our uh, city attorney 
uh, was to clear that up and, and basically gave us a script to do that, which we read into the record. Uh, so as to make clear that the chief had access to those dollars. So I think it's an important conversation for us to have. As I sit here now, I don't think there's additional deliberation that needs to happen for the chief to be able to do that. Um, but, but without deciding that question, I'll make sure that we, we get the opportunity as a council to, to all address this during, during a work session before the year. First opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Mayor. I, you know, that's the way I read it as well. But, but again, the manager, it's my understanding that the manager in his individual conversations is, is not, is understanding that not everybody who voted on it understood it that way. So I, I absolutely think it's important for that conversation. So thanks so much for scheduling it. And as part of the conversation, Chief, I know that you had time to be mid-January because of the not having the, the overtime available. And the question that, I had that hasn't been answered for me yet is, if we had an additional three to $5 million to spend, what does it cost to buy mid-January to, to mid-February? Or cost to buy mid-February to, to mid-March so that the uh, broader conversation could ensue as we had set up in our process, in our mid-year um, uh, uh, budgeting of policing, as well as the uh, specific invitation to come back to the council to discuss over time if it was insufficient. So we can make that part of the conversation that we have at the, at the work session. Yes, Mayor, we can try and break it down to what it would cost to save those 95 uh, positions if potential on an overtime basis. And then uh, again, the reason for the January 17th date is it takes that long to make this happen. We have to identify the officers who are going to be moved. We have to give them the opportunity to exercise their rights under the contract for hardships and grievances. And then we have to give them a 28 day notice before we can transfer them. So this is a very involved process. So not only did we have to do the work ahead of time of deciding where we would pull them from, then we had to start the process of making that happen. No, no, I saw that, but, but if the key day when you were running out of money was January 15th, then you need to act, you know, some months before that. If the key date was not January 15th, but February 15th or March 15th or April 15th, uh, the date by which you needed to act gets pushed back or, or, or moves up further uh, so that there would have been a chance to do this perhaps and impact some of the attrition level that officers have seen because they you had to back up to August to tell people that there would be movement out of units into patrol, whereas it, it might not have been required for you to start that as early and you could have come back to the, to the, to the council. And the other numbers is we're just kind of highlighting things to, to talk about. My understanding is, is that uh, of the 150 folks in the units, 150 positions that have moved, 55 of those uh, were, were, were vacant. And, and as of the end of September, my understanding is without regard to our budget decisions, which took place in October, that, that there were uh, a significant number of, of unit folks that were already rotating through uh, patrol. Um, uh, another, I don't know, 70 or 80 officers at the end of September that were already rotating. So with the 55 and that 70, we already had uh, 120 some odd of the 150 that were not currently staffed in, in units uh, as you were moving people through. And, and I think that goes to what Councilmember Alter was saying a second ago, that the, that the number of actual personnel changes was substantially less, the impact, than, than hearing, uh, as we heard in, in August, that there was 150 uh, folks being moved, or, or people, that's what they heard. I know that wasn't the wording because you're talking about spots and the like, but there was a belief in the community that 150 people were being moved. So better understanding uh, how many people were already in that position as of the end of September, the end of last fiscal year, I think would be helpful for the community to be able to put in perspective what we're looking at. 
I'll have that information as well, Mayor. We were doing roughly 60 to 65 officers on a rotational basis, and then, then they would go back to their unit and different officers would go. That way, we weren't shutting down any units or anything. This is just a more permanent plan, given the fact that we don't see any relief for at least a year with the cadet class uh, stoppage and before we can get more officers. So I'll have that information for you, Mayor. And I think that's true. We might have been able, since you had 55 that weren't filled and you had another 65 that were rotating through, we might have been able just to preserve that same system that you had uh, for another X number of months without having to make a really substantial change and just say, we'll just continue the existing practice that you have. And the cost to be able to do that and extend that for another month or two or three or four might be the number that we would have been looking at uh, if that's something that had been rolled out to us. But not, not, not too late. You know, maybe, maybe there's a chance for us still to, to be able to, to do that. Uh, um, and that's, I think, the conversation that Councilmember Tobo is asking and others have asked that we you know, kind of bring back. And I'll work with uh, Assistant City Manager Ariano and the City Manager uh, in, in, in your office to make sure we tee that back up for count, for the full council. Thank you. Councilmember Kassar. Sorry for rewinding a little bit, but back to the mayor and Councilmember Tobo's discussion for a work session. I'm okay with, and of course, avail, ready to talk about anything we want to talk about, but just to update everyone, my most recent conversations have highlighted that I don't think there's a single member that reads our budget differently than the way we've described it. And I don't think there's a single member that has that, that, that has raised any objection in part because it's not logical. If the, the, if the reimagined fund were inaccessible, then there would be another $50 million hole we'd be talking about here today. So it just isn't logical. So I'm fine to discuss it, but I don't, I, 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 I find it, a little frustrating and confusing about why it would need further discussion because it, it, it doesn't make sense uh, if you read the budget the way we passed it. So happy to talk about it, but my understanding is there isn't a member that has a different understanding than what it is we passed. Other questions? Well, thank you, uh, Chief and everybody for participating today. Um, you know, the, my hope in the staffing conversation as it continues is to really, really hone in on the methodology. And I'm glad we got to have a little bit of that conversation today. We talked a little bit more about the pressing issues than I expected, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue, Chief, uh, you and, and, and the committee to hone in on how these decisions pull which levers over time. And as we achieve call diversion, as we've started to achieve in mental health and where those other opportunities might lie, how we can make sure we're we're dovetailing our operational decisions. Also, good insight to keep in mind that a change, the changes you make have this months of lead up because of police union contract issues or other process matters. That's always a good a good thing to keep in mind. And thanks to all my colleagues for for being in the meeting today. I mean, we don't often get to have a process conversation because of Toma, and maybe one of the better reasons why we do these committee meetings. And thanks to my non-members for showing up. Um, and allowing us to have a pretty robust conversation and take this thing to the full council. And then Mayor, you can be in charge of that meeting. <laughs> uh, I think that is our last item on the agenda today. Any further comments? We give everybody 30 minutes back. All right, thanks everybody for a great meeting. It's 4.29 p.m. and this meeting of the Public Safety Committee is adjourned.